Leptin is arguably the most important adipokine. It's also the adipokine that really changed the game because it was the first one that was discovered and it, the discovery of leptin really kind of changed our view altogether of what adipose tissue is. We used to think it just sat there and stored fat, but the discovery of leptin really showed us that adipose tissue is a dynamic tissue. So I really want to start this conversation about leptin by going over how it was discovered because then it gives you an idea of the scientific process but it also gives you an idea of what led us there and why it was so groundbreaking. So back in the 50s in um, a Jackson's lab in the United States they had mice that they were continuously breeding for different purposes and all of a sudden a mouse with a spontaneous mutation um, was discovered within a otherwise normal litter of mice that was about three times the size of its litter mates, ate a lot, and had moderate levels of diabetes. Okay? They named it the OBOB mouse, OB for obesity, because they believe this mouse had some sort of autosomal recessive condition that promoted the obesity that they found. So first spontaneous thing that happened was the discovery of this OBOB mouse. Several years later, another mouse within the same lab actually also arose through spontaneous mutation that was similar to the OBOB mouse, but it had slightly different phenotype. So it was also obese, it also ate quite a bit, but its diabetes was far more severe and they believe that the mutation was found on a different chromosome. But there was like something going on, there's something going on genetically in these mice that occurred spontaneously and that promoted these conditions in these mouse, which suggested that some things might be going on genetically promoting obesity in both mice and more diabetes in the DBDB mouse. So that, uh, so we still don't know what this is. Um, lots of questions still uh, were there. So we wanted to learn a little bit more about these mice and that led to some really interesting, what are called parabiosis studies um, several years later in Douglas Coleman's lab. And what uh, parabiosis studies are, and you can look up videos on this on the internet if you wanna see, but they basically attach to mice, they attach their um, they attach their legs together, they attach their arms together, so they stay together and they walk together. But they also attach their their abdomens together as well. And quite quickly, the the there's a, a microcirculation that develops between the two mice to the point where those two mice share a circulatory system. Okay, so these mice will have their own tissues own tissue specific machinery but what is common is that the circulatory systems are linked and uh, factors can move between the two circulatory systems okay so I want you to try to figure out how they came to the conclusions they came to so we're gonna do this in class but if you want to do it on your own I want you guys to look at the results of these parabiosis studies and try to figure out why they determined or concluded what they concluded, okay? We're starting off with what we know, which is there's a wild type mouse with the normal weight. We have an OBOB mouse that's obese, moderate diabetes, not severe, and a DBDB mouse that has more severe diabetes um, uh, and is also obese. Our hypothesis was that one had a missing gene product for a particular circulating factor and one we believed had the missing receptor for that circulating factor, okay? So like I said, I want you to try to figure out how they came to the conclusions they came to and like I said, we're gonna do this in class as well, but this is basically, and you can we're gonna use these slides to look at that, but this is basically how they linked mice together to study what was going on and these were what we saw in each of the cases of those parabiosis uh, linkages that we did. So like I said, I want you guys to try to come up with how they got to their conclusions. I'm going to tell you what their conclusions are, but you got to figure out why these conclusions were met. Um, 
one of their conclusions was that there's some sort of humoral factor, something circulating in the blood that the wild type was providing that regulates food consumption in the obese partner that was linked to the wild type. And further, to get more specific, that OBOB mouse was unable to produce sufficient amounts of something that they called a satiety factor involved in regulating its food consumption. Whereas they believe the DBDB mouse produces enough of that satiety factor, but they don't respond to it. So I said, like we said, we're going to go over that in class, but I just wanted to show you how we kind of came to some of the conclusions we came to. Okay, so overall, we're not going to focus a lot on the DBDB mouse, but for the OBOB mouse, the main conclusion is that some satiety factor was missing that was causing these OBOB mice to get so large, to eat so much, and to have this moderate diabetes. But what is it? I don't know. Decades later, <laughs> in Friedman's lab um, in the United States as well, something happened that really changed the game. And what happened is they used a technique called positional cloning to try to figure out where in the genome, the gene for that satiety factor was located. Because they knew that there was some sort of mutation in that gene that was compromised in the OBOB mice, but they didn't know where, where in the genome that, that position was, okay, that gene was. And Friedman was able to locate the location on the genome where that satiety factor was being, was coded for, okay? And this is actually the most interesting part. Once they knew that, they tried to figure out where that gene was being expressed, okay? And they found, and this was groundbreaking, they found that that gene product, the one that was responsible for that satiety, was being secreted or was being expressed in white adipose tissue, not in other tissues. And I know that doesn't sound like a big deal, but it was actually a really freaking big deal. Because before that, we had no idea that adipocytes secreted anything. <laughs> like I said, we just thought they sat there. But now Friedman's um, experiments showed that not only do we know where in the genome that satiety factor is being coded for, we also know that the cells that express them are primarily white adipocytes. We'll later find out that it's expressed in other tissues as well, but it's primarily expressed in these white adipocytes. Okay? And although these experiments were done in mice, they actually uh, found that that uh, amino acid sequence was approximately 80% identical between humans and mouse as far as that secreted protein goes. Okay, So again, this was actually a pretty big moment in science. And both Coleman and Freeman later on in 2010 received a prestigious award for what has led to the discovery of, of leptin. Okay, so I want you to watch his interview as well where he talks a little bit about it. And I like his interview too because you see that scientists are humans as well. Okay, but all of that was getting to figure out that there's some sort of satiety factor being secreted by adipocytes that is compromised in this OBOB mouse. And the satiety factor, they called it leptin. Leptose is Greek for thin, because they believe that having that, because we know that having that satiety factor and its reception working properly is responsible for making sure that um, obesity doesn't develop and that uh, hyperphagia doesn't exist or doesn't isn't promoted, okay? so. Some sort of satiety hormone, and we learn more about it since then as well, is a plasma pro product of the OB gene. Like I mentioned, it is secreted by white adipose tissue, and the more white adipose tissue that there is, the more leptin that is being secreted. Okay, uh, there are leptin um, neuro uh, leptin uh, receptors in various different tissues on the body, but there's a lot that are found within the hypothalamus. Okay, so a lot of uh, tissues express that receptor, but 
what's kind of key to the leptin obesity linkage as far as hyperphagia and the development obesity goes, it really has to do with the hypothalamic action of leptin. Okay, so just to kind of break this down a little bit more and to give you a little more specifics about how leptin works, these are adipocytes. And when adipocytes get larger, okay, because remember leptin secretion is proportional to um, uh, lat size. When our adipocytes get larger, more leptin is released, okay? Leptin goes and acts on its receptors that are found primarily in the arcuate nucleus of the hypothalamus. And that leads, the main action that that leads to is a decrease in appetite, okay? And an increase in satiety or that feeling of fullness. And, it, and also an increase in energy expenditure as well, as well, but that's less understood that pathway, okay? So when appetite goes down, when satiety goes up, ideally, <laughs> that's gonna lead to that feedback loop that is leading to our adipocytes getting smaller. So this is, the leptin system works to make sure that our adipocytes don't get too large, because when they do get large, our appetite would go down, okay? As you can imagine, something's up though with obesity. In obesity, this sensing system isn't working properly, okay? So to get a little bit more specific about what leptin does, like I said, it does have an effect on uh, increasing energy expenditure, specifically we believe through bat thermogenesis. Um, but the main action of leptin that is understood is that leptin has a satiety effect, satiety promoting effect, because it inhibits the orexigenic or appetite inducing neurons in the arcuate nucleus of the hypothalamus. And it also stimulates the anorexigenic or appetite suppressing POMC and CART neurons found again in the hypothalamus. So we're gonna see this slide later when we talk about appetite and you're gonna have to actually know it quite well. But just to kind of show you more schematically what I'm talking about, remember that leptin is secreted by adipose tissue. It has its leptin receptors on various sites, even within the hypothalamus. I like to say that our appetite system in our hypothalamus, well, it is dually regulated. There's kind of an eat pathway or an appetite inducing pathway and a don't eat pathway or a satiety pathway. Okay. Leptin has a stimulatory effect on the satiety pathway, and it has an inhibitory effect on the um, appetite pathway or the eat pathway, like I like to call it. Okay. And again, this is why leptin helps to reduce food consumption and ideally keep our body in energy balance. So we like leptin as far as energy balance goes. Okay. What's interesting about leptin too, beyond the fact that, you know, um, compromised leptin system can promote obesity, what's also interesting is that leptin also forms a link between adipose tissue and, the, and immune function. What we're going to learn more and more about is that in obesity, there is a chronic low-grade inflammation where the immune system, it's not fully active, like it's fighting off a pathogen, but it's more active and there's more cells that are recruited even when nothing is provoking that, well, the obesity is provoking it. And we believe that one of the things about obesity that promotes this low-grade chronic inf inflammation is the compromise secreting patterns of leptin, but other adipokines as well, okay? So we kind of know this first point here, um, and we know that it has that appetite decreasing effect, but it also has this um, inflammatory effect, again, if it's being secreted at more high levels. And this is believed to be part of the link between um, the energy balance system and the immune system as well, okay? So there are different ways that leptin works, and in particular to promote immune functions. Leptin is involved in both innate immunity, so immunity that's more nonspecific, like that, that's active to get rid of kind of 
normal things in the body, more non-specifically, not necessarily pathogen-specific immunity. Okay, so leptin promotes the activity of a bunch of different immune cells, uh, innate immunity immune cells. And also, uh, leptin is also involved in adaptive immunity. So that immune um, function, that's more related to like fighting off a particular pathogen and remembering it as well. And I'm just showing you this again to show you how much leptin is linked to the um, change or the activity of a number of different immune factors, okay? Linking leptin secretion and energy balance really to the immune system, okay? So to kind of bring this concept together, and what I like this slide is, is that it's actually a graphical abstract, which is becoming more and more popular in, in certain review articles. Um, and I think that's interesting because I'm asking you guys to do something similar for um, your communication assignment. And what this graphical abstract shows is that in kind of a normal situation, normal adipocytes, yes, leptin is secreted, and leptin secretion, it promotes that hypothalamic pathway, the melanocortin system, which we haven't really gotten to yet, but, but this is that system I'm talking about there. We'll get to that later. It promotes that melanocortin system, which promotes energy balance. Okay, right? So when our normal adipocytes secrete leptin, it kind of has that appetite reducing effect. Okay, in addition, in normal adipocytes, leptin also has that stimulation of immune function, but helping the immune system function normally, not promoting that higher, higher activation of the immune system that we see with the chronic low-grade inflammation that we see in obesity, okay? So with obesity, which is over here, in obesity, we can see our adipo adipocytes are larger and we also see more immune cells that are going to be within and associated with that adipose tissue. Leptin secretion is going up in obesity. However, that sensing system is compromised and we're gonna talk about that later. Okay, leptin isn't really the problem in obesity, it's more uh, leptin resistance, that's the issue. Okay, there's some sort of impaired melanocortin system, okay, that's actually promoting energy balance shifting to a positive energy balance where we're more likely to be gaining fat on the body and promoting obesity, okay. And also in obesity, not only does kind of obesity promote obesity, which is what this is showing, but obesity also, that higher leptin that, are, that is secreted in obesity and other factors that are changed in obesity, that's also promoting that disturbed immune response, where we have a higher activation of the immune system. And like I keep saying, that higher activation of the immune system, that chronic low-grade inflammation, we believe that's the main link between obesity and comorbidities like cardiovascular disease and type 2 diabetes, okay? So leptin must be the solution for obesity then, isn't it? Why can't I just give it, if it helps people like eat less, why don't I just give people more leptin, okay? Really a negligible amount of cases of obesity are associated with leptin deficiency where it's not being made. Okay, in those cases, individuals that are born with congenital leptin deficiency, yes, if we give them leptin, if we administer exogenous leptin, we do see quite a quick reduction in food intake and reduction in uh, adiposity as well. However, when I say negligible cases, I mean like we don't even have data on it. We don't actually know the percentage because it's so low, okay? The majority of cases of obesity that are linked with leptin issues, the issue is more leptin resistance, okay? And we don't fully understand how that leptin resistance is developing, just like we don't fully understand how insulin resistance develops, but we know that's one of the main links there. So leptin, one of the most important, if like, I'm gonna say the most important adipokine and if it's working properly, that should help make sure that we stay in energy balance and that our immune system is functioning normally. However, in obesity, typically what happens is we have high circulating le uh, levels of leptin 
and just our hypothalamus doesn't respond to it or doesn't respond as appropriately as it should. And those higher levels of leptin are also promoting a more uh, significant immune response, which again, we believe is linking obesity to its comorbidities. Okay, but again, that's just one adipokine. We'll learn about a few others in the next section.